Hey there, everyone. How are you? Hope you're well. It's 5.34 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 12.18, whatever. Uh, this is probably going to be kind of messy, but what else is new? Um, th this is probably going to be <clears throat> followed up by a paper. I don't know what the length is going to be, <clears throat> and I didn't really... I hadn't planned this out. Um, I was actually studying geography uh, just so that I could move forward the exodus under a microscope, which I'm not scrapping that. I had to scrap uh, the one, one or two that I did a long time ago because for any of you that will remember the one I started doing, the uh, exodus <laughs> months ago, um, that actually precipitated the two papers I did. Well, first, the patriarchs, their livestock, and the land. Just showing that, that the land of, of Palestine, no matter what way you cut it, you could even make the whole thing green. You could believe in desertification if you wanted to, but it's still not going to sustain. And there's, there's, simple, there, there's simple passages that I can quote to you to show that this place just couldn't sustain the amount of people. Now, any scholar out there, absolutely every single scholar that would think I'm crazy for, for the wild theories, they would probably say, that I have about these things, even they would have to just very quickly admit, yeah, we're probably looking at two to three million Israelites uh, entering with Joshua. Uh, into the promised land that, and that's just Israelites that's that's not counting um, what King James would call the mixed multitude that would have been with them because there was another population of people that that were with Abraham from the start I showed this in the patriarchs their livestock in the land it was quite a population of people and uh, so they would admit that there was at least that number coming into the promised land, two to three million. Now keep in mind that Yahweh says to them before they come into the promised land, he says, I'm going to dispossess seven nations greater and stronger than you. So they have two to three million people. So simple math, two times seven 14, 3 times 7 is 21. So in addition to the Israelites, 14 to 21 million more people. Now currently, everything that is uh, called both Palestine and Israel uh, over there in the, uh, the Middle East, put all those lands together and the peoples living on them, and you've got, I'm guessing uh, the last time they made a claim, it was what, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 6 million uh, people, maybe more, 6 to 8 million people, they claim. I, I think that's, I think I'm going high. I think I'm going really high with that. But even at those numbers that they're claiming, you know, they have to, they have to treat water from the Mediterranean to give people water in one part of, of that land um, and then the other part of the land they've got to take a heck of a lot of water from Lake Tiberias um, and the Jordan and so does the country of Jordan they take a lot of water from that too because it's a desert lower Palestine is a desert it's not a nice desert it's a nasty desert you know and then a, a good part of Jordan, of course, is a desert. Upper Saudi Arabia, desert. A good part of Syria, desert. You know, it, yeah, the northern part of Palestine is, it's nice. It's not big enough. Can't hold the populations, can't hold the cities, can't hold the people. We can't do it, folks. And, um, you know, I've said this until I'm blue in the face. And I hope this will sink in. This was not in any way my goal was that, you know, I really wanted to work on just the language. That, that's enough of a challenge right there.
to get past the the Masora, the Masoretic Nakud, that is just a layer of language over the initial original language made to put applied to the language to make it seem more Eastern than Western. More, perhaps if you want to say more Arabic than Proto-Indo-European or Germanic. I would have liked to have spent most of my time on that. And, and I, anytime I can, I get back to that. There's so much that I see uh, every day that needs attention. There's so many changes that I have to make to um, my initial Strong's list where Strong's has gone astray. And I don't really think they ever went astray, folks. I don't think any of this is a mistake. If it is, then, for instance, those scholars who translated the King James and the ones who <sighs> made the English translations before it that they used to get their official King James translations, they weren't very scholarly. So I'd, I'd love to work on just the language. However, this issue with geography and can you can you fit these kind of people into this area is such a glaring problem and on really on face viewing there are things that seem they seem to fit um for instance the western border is the yum In fact, it's, it's frequently called Yom Gadul, uh, so the Great Sea. There is, um, there is something that is, is called Yom Kanrath, which they would say that's the Sea of, uh, and then sometimes it's uh, translated uh, Kinnereth, uh, and they say that that was later the Sea of of uh, Galilee and so on. Um, problem is the the region that we would see as et Galil, and in, in, again that word et Galil, it's describing a sort of a region, and it's, it's it's actually more of a generic word. But the region it's describing wouldn't even be near uh, that body of water. If in fact we're talking about a body of water, um, there's problems. Of course, with uh, Yarden, the uh, the Nair in Scripture, and its description uh, as compared to the Jordan over in Palestine, and this Yam Amela as compared to uh, the Dead Sea and surrounding areas. There's a lot of problems there. However, those those few features along with just a couple others they really make most people think well yeah this is this is the this is obviously the land of the bible obviously i mean what about all these mentions of of lebanon and to this day there's this country uh, north of palestine called lebanon there's even still a city there called uh Tyr? Is it Tyr that's still there? No, it's, sorry. Should be Sidon that's still there. My apologies. I have a map of it open. Anyways, so there's a lot of places mentioned in the Bible that still seem to exist. No, there it is. They're saying it's uh, Tyr, um, and in the Bible it's actually Tzur. Um, interesting root, Tzur. Um, that shows up in in the name of a lot of places uh, that are listed in the Promised Land or Canaan or you know Eretz Amory, Hatzur and Hatzaruth. Um, so a lot of this kind of seems like um, it's it's correct. Like these places are still there, and uh, even when you read the New Testament. 
So you can start out in Matthew. And there's a quote in the Greek of, of Matthew in the New Testament that is quoting from the so-called Old Testament about, um, I called my son from Mitzrim. And uh, in the so-called Old Testament, Yahweh refers to Israel as his firstborn son. Um, and then that's applied uh, to you show, but uh, Mitzram doesn't show up. It, they call it Egyptus, which uh, definitely sounds far far more like Egypt, correct, than Mitzram. Uh, in fact, I would recommend every, for the, the for the price you would pay, which is only a few dollars. Go and get that. You can only get it on Kindle, unfortunately. Get Ashraf Ezat's Israel knew no, or um, Egypt knew no, no Israelites nor Pharaohs. Or no, no Pharaohs nor Israelites. You'll find it. Ashraf Ezat. He has a YouTube channel as well. Now, um, me and, and, and Dr. Ezat, he is a doctor. We don't, uh, and he's actually a medical doctor. Uh, he does his researching and writing uh, on the site. We don't agree on the origins of the Bible or the place because he actually puts the place uh, where these things happened at a, just a far different location but still in the Middle East. And that's where uh, we wildly differ. But as I said, uh, I was actually doing geographical work uh, having to do with these videos, I'm doing uh, the Exodus under a microscope, and those will uh, those will stay up, and those will just keep going. They'll keep being added to. One of the problems I was finding when I was uh, looking into that was, for instance, uh, tribal inheritance. I brought up a lot of different maps that people have made that are uh, supposed to be, you know, maps of the Middle East, maps of Palestine, and, and how the tribal inheritances would work in that. Um, and they can't make the descriptions that I read, especially in Joshua, they can't make those work, hard as they may try. Uh, as well as they, they can't find the river, that was uh, the the separation point, and it is a nair, okay? It's it's not a little wadi or something. It's referred to uh, in Genesis fifteen eighteen when Abram is first given the promise of this land by Yahweh. It's referred to as a nair. It's also referred to later as a nahal. But as I explained in one of my previous videos, that a nair can be a nahal, and everything I see concerning nair. Um, it looks to be uh, like a large Nahal. Um, I would imagine that you could put almost anything that is carrying water from one place to the other into the description of Nahal. But just like in English, um, we have words like brook, stream, um, river, we have various different words to describe different size things. So they can't show what would actually be uh, Nair Mitzram. And there's no way it's the Nile, first off. It's not a chance. Now, in the Bible, it has a name. It's called Shihur. And sometimes the same word isn't always spelled exactly the same. And you have to contextualize it. The problem was, I was actually finding uh, Shihur in, or possibly having to do with the inheritances of two other tribes. And that was, uh, that was disconcerting, uh, to say the least. Not only that, I was finding landmarks that didn't seem like they should be where 
where the Bible was saying that they are, or were. And, of course, they couldn't even uh, hope to match up with any possible uh, mapping scenario that I have yet seen concerning uh, Bible events happening in the Middle East, uh, specifically Palestine. So the people who, who shoot back with this and want an answer right away to, well then, where is it? I have ideas. Um, but, you know, that's, that's a logical fallacy to say that you have to have an answer in order to show that a current model is incorrect. You don't. You really don't. So, I have ideas, um, but I'll spend a little time just showing you how it doesn't work here. I'm going to start out with uh, a couple of verses that, well, what, what ended up happening is uh, I was spending so much time on the southern border, and we're going to see how borders and rivers, Nahal or Nair, have everything to do with one another. So I started out there in the south, and because I had to um, map by description, mostly from Joshua and some in Judges and some in uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy, uh, I ended up up north. And uh, there were some problems that I saw up north, and I really had to see them to their end. And I do want to make something clear. There's a there's an idea, uh, sort of a mentality. I don't know who started it, but there is uh, definitely this sort of mentality that um, that everything should be sort of straightforward in the Bible, and if it's not straightforward and easy to understand, there's there's something wrong. Um, it's a very Kent Hovind mentality. Um, like when he talks about creation, I've seen him do debates, like for instance with Hugh Ross, concerning uh, a literal six day, sun comes up, sun goes down, sun comes up, sun, sun goes down, a literal six day creation. And he will tell you over and over again, you know, the Bible is simple, straightforward, easy to understand. Anybody can read this, and they will easily understand this. And he's, he's either lying or he's ignorant. Um, there are so many cases in which that's not true. And you can't just take these cursory looks at the Bible and understand what's going on. The same word, yom, used in Genesis 1, that, every, that many people who want a literal six day uh, seem to forget, is yom can also be ages, very easily, because it's used as ages. Undefined expanses of time. And, in fact, Yahweh works within that sort of structure. So whether he did this in six expanses of time called Eum, and then on the seventh expanse of time, seventh Eum, he rested and initiated the Sabbath. Or if it was days, you would have to spend far more time than somebody like Ken Hoven does to reach the proper answer on that. Um, I guess I can't repeat this enough. Proverbs 25.2. In English, it said it's the glory of Alayim, and I'm not going to say God. And I can show you any time why I don't use the word God. It's the glory of Alayim to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Um, in Obery, it's actually using the words kabod, which is, is like weight, kabod aliyim, um, 
Asathar, uh, hid. Debar, his word. It's his glory to hide his word. And Kabod, that word again, the weight, glory. Malachim, kings. Chakar, search out. Debar, not a matter, his word. So it's his glory to hide things in his word and to hide his word. However, it's the glory of Malachim, kings, to search out his word. So, anybody who has that mindset that it should all be simple and straightforward or it's uh, bogus, um, they're bogus. All right, so I'll, I'll get on with it. Like I said, this is going to be messy, but there will be a, a paper in the future, and I will do a reading of it. I hope I'll have time to do a video along with it. It made me kind of sad that I wasn't able to actually provide a visual element to uh, the land of Amory, although I would still like to. So um, I've got a map of the Middle East and the Palestine area and Syria and Lebanon, Jordan, all of that opened. So you'll see if you uh, look at the screen what is currently deemed as uh, the, the area of Israel is this little strip here by the Mediterranean. Then you have Lebanon, the country to the north, and then you have Syria, of course, to the north and northeast. And now the thing is, you have to go quite a long distance, um, hundreds of miles easily, um, northeast of modern Damascus to reach the Euphrates. You see, every time you'll see Parath, from Obery, Parath. They'll translate it as Euphrates. And you can see uh, a couple of little reservoir like lakes uh, created right in this little stretch of Euphrates, okay? You see them right there. And then the Euphrates actually just continues over this way. And it makes its way in a southeastward direction right by Baghdad and all the way down to the um, uh, the Persian Gulf. That's Euphrates. Okay. Uh, it has its source up here in Turkey in these mountains. Its source is actually a couple of different rivers and those uh, those rivers have nothing to do with the source of the Tigris, which they tell us is the Hodquil. The four rivers that proceeded from Odin are the Gehun, Pishun, Hodquil, and Parath. So that's a long ways away, that uh, Euphrates. Now, part of the Greater Israel Project is they... Uh, they try to say that they were promised this land. Um, and they'll either call them Hashem, which means the name, or they'll oftentimes just straightforward, brazenly call them Gad, with the dash between the G and the D. It's very appropriate, that which is Babylonian god of fortune, or deity of fortune. So the Nile, of course, runs through uh, the center here of, of Egypt, um, which means taking away the the culture and and the livelihood and and uh, I mean they've already taken away the peace of Egypt. They've taken away the peace of the Palestinians. They've taken away the peace of Jordanians. Um, they've taken away uh, what peace many of these people had over in this land before they showed up. This nonsense that the Middle East has always been this hotbed of, yeah, nonsense, lies, bullshit. 
So they say to the Euphrates, which is, of course, way over here, so that would encompass most of Syria, a good deal of Iraq, a big chunk of Saudi Arabia, which doesn't matter since the House of Saud are, are crypto Jews anyways. Jordan. You know, there's all this fighting in this, uh, this area here, the Golan Heights, right? That's why they've got these double dotted lines here, because all of their crap. You know, I listened to a video uh, from Karen Smith from Radio Free South Africa yesterday, relatively recent video. And it was really funny, uh, ba back in the 80s, in the early 90s, how the, um, how the press, and we know who owns the press. We know who owns most the international press and why. Why they do what they do, why they run the stories they run. It's not a mystery. Uh, and they would run these stories about how um, blacks who were caught in certain areas that didn't have their cards on them after dark because they had these laws for a reason. Everybody had to abide by them, whites and blacks. They would say how they were treated so so poorly. Um, what about the children that are being shot, wounded? They 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 wound. They they tell they tell is not really soldiers to wound Palestinians because woundings won't won't make the statistics like killings, murders will. So I'm sorry. I went kind of uh, off the side there. This area they call the Golan Heights. Well, okay, so the thing is this. There are these promises, just like I mentioned, how they say that they were promised all of this land and they say from the Nile to the Euphrates. But uh, Yahweh actually makes the promises himself, and I want to show you uh, what he promises to give the descendants of Abram through Yitzhak and Jacob. Genesis 15, 18, it says, In the same day Yahweh made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed I have given this land from the Ner Mitzram unto, and it's best if I kind of tell you what the Obri says, okay, owed unto Ener Agadul, the great Ner, Ner Parath. Unto your seed I have given this land from Ner Mitzram unto Ener Agadul, Ner Parath, to the Parath, okay? Deuteronomy 11.24, Every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours, from the Midbar, wilderness, and Lebanon. Lebanon. It's always called a Lebanon. It's not just called Lebanon. A Lebanon. And that a is there because it's a description. Lebanon is a description. It's not a country. It's not a place. Ever. It's a description of a type of land. Um, I'm assuming, but I, I don't know if I'm right or not, it's a, a, a land made of, of white rock or white mountains, uh, and I would take that from like Lebanon, which are the, the white bricks that are used in uh, Genesis 11 to build the tower in Babel. Um, and so I'm assuming that, that Lebanon, because Leban means white, this is Lebanon, you have that un at the end, it is a suffix meaning that whatever it is is characterized by the root, Laban, Lebanon, eh, Lebanon. Not a country, but a description of a geographical area, just like eh, Galil. Not Galilee, eh, Galil. It's the description of a region. Galil is actually a region. So, from, um, sorry, from Emidbar, and at Lebanon from at Ner, Ner Parath, and Od a Yam, a Acharun, so the far sea, Aya Gabul Kam, so your border. Remember Gabul, that's always used for border. So he promises again 
in Deuteronomy, he tells them, your border is going to be from the Parath. Remember, they always translate Parath as Euphrates. But it isn't so. Well, then there's Joshua 1.4 from the Midbar and Elebanun. Um, I'll do the rest in English. Unto the great river, or Ner, Ner Parath. There, there's three times now I've shown you that their border was promised before they went in that it would be to this Ner Parath. Okay, just keep that in mind. He promises Ner Parath. Remember, their southern border is easily shown that their southern border was Shehur or Ner Mitzram or Nahal Mitzram. All right, this isn't something eschatological. This is a border he promised right there and then and fulfilled it. This will be the border of your land I'm giving you. Straightforward, he's saying. This is going to be your border, Parath, part of your border. And here's a clincher verse. It's in First Chronicles 18.3, and it's also repeated in 2 Samuel 8.3. It says, And David smote Eded Ozer, not Hadadezer, Eded Ozer, Melech Zuba Hamathe. He was the king of of, and it's always important to pay attention, Tsuba Hamathe, city of Tsuba in the land of Hamathe, or pertaining to Hamathe. Sometimes when these kingdoms would take over a city, then you might have it read Aram Tsuba, or Tsuba Aram, so that you knew that it was pertaining to that people. Now, Hamath is the name of one of the children of Canon. So it's Tsuba Hamathe. And this was when he went to make a, a strong station for his border. What border? In Ner Parath. That's his border, in Ner Parath. Yes, it was fulfilled. There are people that actually argue that it was never fulfilled. And that's nonsense. It absolutely was fulfilled to the borders that Yahweh told them they could have. He kept his word right there and then. So, here we have David, or Duid, establishing an outpost as his border. And then, what happened was, we can read, I guess here too, and also in 2 Samuel 8, and then the Aramim, and they always call them Syrians. Why do you suppose that is? They're, they're Arami, um, the same people, you know, that um, Ribka came from, that Rahal and Leah, uh, Jacob's two wives came from, that's where he was staying, was in Padam Aram, there's Aram Nerim, um, they're Arami. But they call them Syrians. They tell us, no, it's the same thing as Assyria. It's Syrians. They don't just translate it as Arami. They always got to give us a different place, just like Mitzram and Egypt, vastly different places. So we have his border. He's establishing the border. Um, and not just establishing, but strengthening it. You'll see that there are a few tribes that um, that border here and there is there's obviously uh, some I'm trying to think of the right word there are definitely some conflicts and early on in Israel's history like you'll see in the book of Judges they had a lot of trouble with the Arami because the Arami were inhabiting what you see here, Damshak, amongst other places. Damshak is what they always translate as Damascus. This Tsuba we'll see quite a lot as well. So we're going to have three really key passages in which Yahweh is actually describing 
Um, he's describing their border. All right. And keep something in mind. I just showed you at least three examples, and there's more I have written down here, of where the parath is their border. Okay? And I'm going to show you one other thing before these passages, too, concerning the parath and their northern border. Two quick verses in Jeremiah 46, 46, 6. Let not the swift flee away, nor the mighty man escape. They shall stumble and fall towards the north by the Nair Parath. The word there, <coughs> excuse me, got a nasty chest cold. Uh, it is Tsipun, north. Same thing with uh, Jeremiah 46.10. For this is the day of Yahweh Aliyim Tsebeuth, a day of vengeance that he may avenge him of his adversaries, and the sword shall devour, and it shall be satiate, and made drunk with their blood. For Yahweh Aleim Tzebeoth hath a sacrifice in the north country, Tzepun, by Ner Parath. Tzepun. It is in the north, Tzepun. It is in the north, Tzepun. It is in the north. Numbers 34. 7. And this shall be your Tsapun, north, Gabul, border. It's exactly what he says in those three passages I read you concerning the Parath. It is called their Gabul. That is their border. And he says, from the great sea, you'll point out for you, it's actually Er, Eh, Er. And they call it Mount Hor. That's an interesting one that we will talk about in the future, believe me. You'll point out unto the entrance of Hamath and the goings forth, and there's some places listed, Sadad, Zaprun. And the last one is this Hatzer Oinen, Hatzer Oinen. And then the east border starts from there and it goes downward. Okay, Hatzer Oinun. So when we go to Ezekiel 48.1, where there is a different type of inheritance um, by tribe described by Yahweh through the prophet Ezekiel, um, where they're to occupy, instead of like how Reuben, Gad, and um, half the tribe of, of Minashe took uh, this chunk of land on the, the far side of Yarden. All of them would be within the bounds that he promised to Abram in the first place. And in this, he's describing their Tsapun Gabul, their north border. And he says that it would be from now he mentions another place called Hathlun, as one goes to Hamath, all the way here to this Hatzer Oinen, which, this is important, is the border of Damshek. This Hatzer Oinen is on the border with this Damshek that they always say is Damascus. That's the border. I want you to keep that in mind. This Hatzer Oinun is pretty much across the border from Damshek. And we'll see it again in Ezekiel 47, 15 through 17. Uh, very similar places are named when we get down here to 47, 16. Uh, I'm sorry, 46, uh, 47, 17. Hatzer Oinun is the border, Gabul, with Damshek. And that's the north border. What is the border promised? Is it not the Parath? So we go back to this map here. And they tell us that Damshak is Damascus. The Euphrates that they tell us is Parath is nowhere near this Damascus. 
it doesn't work. That is their border. Now, there's this area. Remember I told you about the Lebanon? Well, the Lebanon is an area, and it's named that because it's being descriptive. I haven't figured out the description yet. However, we know that this Lebanon area um, encompasses or is close to other locations. Like in Judges 3.3, 3, um, namely five lords of the Palshathim and all the Kanoni and all the Seduni and all the Hui that dwelt in Er a Lebanon and from Bol Hermon. Okay, this is um, also a mount unto the entering of Hamath. Remember, uh, I mentioned Hamath. So we know the area that Lebanon is. Um, and we know that the Parath is close to Lebanon. I've read you those verses. But just to drive it home, Deuteronomy 1 7 turn you and take your journey and go to the mount of the Amorim and unto all the places nigh thereunto in the plain and the hills and the vale and in the south and by the seaside and to the land of the Canonim and unto a Lebanon unto a Ner Egadul the great Ner Ner Parath. Go back to Lebanon, and we can see very easily these verses like uh, Joshua 13.5 in the land of the Giblites, which I wouldn't trust that translation either. Um, this Ghibli or Giblites, um, I actually think that that's just describing a border. Uh, and all a Lebanon towards the sun rising from Balgad under Er Hermon unto the entering into Hamath. This is the area where the Parath runs. There was a Paroa, that's always translated Pharaoh, there was a Paroa named Neka. And he was fighting with Asher to take this area of Parath. And years later, he was very powerful at the time, this Paroa. And a few years later, Nebuchadnezzar defeated him in this same place. And Nebuchadnezzar set up shop uh, in around Hamath and another city in around the land of Hamath. Now, it's interesting that that would be so hotly contested. And you'd have to ask why. One reason is Hamath is clearly on the sea. So, if you asked me, I would say that any king who was desiring to expand their wealth and dominion, which kings tend to do, kings tend to do and empires tend to do, they would definitely want a strong and wealthy port area and I believe that that's exactly what we're looking at it was a port area because the Parath this great Nair this great river Parath flowed just to the north of the tribal bounds that were promised and given by Yahweh and it emptied out into the sea Yam Gadul. That's why this Paroa wanted and went and fought with the king of Asher for this place because it was very desired. Now we know that the tribes absolutely um, border on these areas. We know that um, one of the tribes encompassed this area called Sidun Rabbe, 
greater Sedun. And we know, even though they tried to change it on us, that one of the tribes, Asher, had a bit of a portion that was part of Hamath. Now in Joshua 19.35, it's describing, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it's usually trans translated as fenced cities or reinforced cities or who knows, walled cities, castled cities, not sure. But it's really funny. They turn um, this descriptive word, Sedim, into its own city. They do this all the time, and the city counts never add up. Always go to the end of a description of all these cities in a tribe, and notice that when it gives you the amount of cities, it almost never, ever, ever matches up to all of the, <laughs> the names they give you. See, something's up. Something's drastically wrong. Um, it, the same with this Rakath here. So, they give us in Naphtali, they're, they're saying that these Mabatsar, and, um, which I would say that definitely means like a walled city or like a, I don't know if I'd say castle, but it's definitely got that connotation to it, if not denotation. Two things we find. One is Tsur, 6863 in Strong's Tsur. Now they'll say that's a distinct and separate place in Palestine, but it's right at the north, and Tsur was at the north, and then right after this we see Hamath, and then this Rakath. And they try to say that this is a different place than the Hamath that we read about so many times, which is Strong's H2574, Hamath, you'll see it. Um, it's always up, up here in the north, like num Numbers 1321. So they went up, they searched the land from the wilderness of Tzan unto Rahab as men come to Hamath. There it is, from the entrance of Hamath. Um, and again, we saw it when I read Joshua 13.5, the land of the Ghibli and the Lebanon towards the sun rising from Bulgad under Er Hermon or Mount Hermon unto the entering of Hamath. But this sort of geography doesn't work for them. So when we see in Joshua 1935 that part of Naphtali included Hamath, they put it all by itself here in Strong's listing 25. 75, and it's clearly Hamath, but afterwards we see Rakath. If you look at the root of Rak, you'll see that there's sort of a, a meaning there like a, a thinness, Rakuth. What that can, <coughs> excuse me, literally mean is that they had these um, portions of Hamath, the edges. It's the same thing with this Tzadim Tzur. Tzadim, Tzad, side. The sides of Tzur and Hamath, Rakath. So part of Naphtali's border was, I would say, a portion of Tsur because Tsur was another major port. In fact, it appears in the description that I've read as a sort of isthmus, perhaps. And Hamath is a land or country. So these two words, Tsadim and Rakath, I don't think that they are cities whatsoever. They are descriptives. They had this sort of portion of Tsur, and that's the city that's always translated as Tyr, and Hamath Rakath, Hamath, 
in Naphtali. And we have one more thing that's in Asher. So in Asher, we see a few verses before. Um, they're describing their cities. They border with Zebulun, because Zebulun borders on Sidon. And we can see in this description of uh, Asher and its cities, um, we see Rahab, which we know Rahab has to be to the north. Um, you do a search on Rahab, you'll see that. The, uh, the king that David defeated, Edadozer, was the son of Rahab. This is a city in the north. Um, Hamun, Kine, even unto Rabah Tzedun, or Tzedun Rabah, Greater Tzedun. It's an area, it's a large area. And then it repeats Ramah here, and it says, And to the strong city Tzur, same Tzur. There are common cities that are on the borders of um, tribal inheritances. So these are all to the north. All of these, well, mostly Naphtali, Asher, um, and Zebulun, uh, mostly towards the north. So then let me try to condense this now a little bit. If you are listening to this and you're thinking these are a lot of different place names, this is a lot of various bits of information, uh, great. Uh, you're catching on. That's true. There is a lot of information. There are a lot of place names. There are a lot of descriptions. That's the truth. There are. However, we can see from this material, as I showed you in Ezekiel 47 and Ezekiel 48, that Damshak, that they always translate as Damascus, is on the northern border. I've shown you that Parath is to the north. I've shown you a few different descriptions of the border in the north. I've shown you how David went up to the north and defeated a king while he was establishing a station at his northern border, which is Parath. If Damshak is on one side, oh, and by the way, <coughs> Damshak is one of the main cities of the Arami, this people, the Arami, not the Amory, don't get them confused with the Amory, the Arami. Damshak is one of the main cities of the Arami. The main land described of the Arami is this place called um, Aram Norim. That is, if you just mechanically translate it, it would be Aram of the Rivers. So you can bet. Damshek is on the north side of the Parath. Their northern border was promised to be Parath. We can see it in relation to this area called the Lebanon, not a country, a descriptive area. And from the way it's described, it appears that the Parath flowed eastward and out to the sea. And the reason you can have this large area called Hamath, with it appears to be a city as well, um, but mostly a country, it's Aratz Hamath. And you can see something like uh, a, a big, strong city like Tzur, um, and a few other cities in that area, is that this great river Parath flowed eastward and emptied out into the sea, um, and this would have been a very productive, rich seaport, which is precisely why Peroa and Neke wanted that port, which Asher, I'm sorry, yeah, Ashur, a, not Asher the tribe, but Ashur the nation with a U or U in it, Ashur, 
had already taken years before that Nebuchadnezzar desired very much, he took that in the early days of his conquest and he set up his station there. There. He was taking kings of Jerusalem up to where he was at in the area of Hamath. And um, the city that he was stationed at is, I believe it's Ribla. I'm going to make sure. Yeah, here it is. So they brought him up to the king of Babel, to Ribla, and he gave judgment on them. Um, 2 Kings 23.33 And Paroa Nekeh put him in bands at Ribla in the land of Hamath, that he might not reign in Jerusalem, and put the land to a tribute of a hundred talents of silver and talents of gold. So first, this Paroa Nekeh um, ruled at Ribla for some time, only a few years, actually. And then um, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babel, uh, defeated him. Uh, Paroa Nekeh headed back to Mitzram, not Egypt. And that's where um, Nebuchadnezzar had set up shop and dwelt there for quite some time. So what should start emerging is a very different map. Yahweh promised that Parath would be their border from the Ner Parath to the Ner Mitzram, Genesis 15, 18. David went to recover his border, it says that in 2 Samuel 8, 3, and in 1 Chronicles 18, 3, established a station at his border, Parath, his northern border. I've shown you how it is Tsepun Gabul, the northern border. <coughs> Excuse me. So before I wrap this up, I, I told you I was going to point out how Gabul border um, has a lot to do with Nahal. And I'd have to go through so many verses to illustrate this, and it'll probably turn up in some papers and videos in the future. Something that you're going to see over and over and over and over is Nahal or Nair as borders. We see that, I mean, look at the eastern United States. Look at most countries. Look at the border between uh, the United States and Mexico. What is it? It's the, most of it is the Rio Grande because rivers establish natural borders. You're going to see them as borders everywhere you look in the world because they, they, they are a great border and they're a strong border. We can see that the, uh, the river that uh, ran between the area that the Amory had taken from Moab and the land of the children of Ammon, that river was a very strong border, it's described as. In fact, rivers are such common borders if you see Gabul, I would say nine times out of ten when you see Gabul, you can think river, either Nahal or Nair. Either way, it's going to be Nahal. Now, one reason I know that is because anytime you see the word inheritance in, um, in the Bible, and I'm going to try to just type this in real quick, We'll see if I can even spell it correctly. I am not the best speller. Okay. Here we go. Inheritance. Nahal. Nahalath. Nahale. Uh, 51, 59. And usually it's going to be expressed in the text as Nahalath. And it's used as inheritance, Nahalath. You see it all over the place in Joshua when the tribes take their inheritance. 
Numbers 34.14. Minashe, they've received their Nahalath, their inheritance. In the land, Nahalath. A river is Nahal, an inheritance is Nahalath. Anytime you see Gabul, think nine times out of ten there's going to be a Nahal. So whenever you see the northern border described in Numbers 34, Ezekiel 47, Ezekiel 48, there ought to be a Nair or Nahal there. And we know there's got to be a Nahal there because it was promised and printed multiple times throughout the text that I showed you that it would be Parath. And the map of the Middle East does not show what they tell us is the Parath anywhere near what they tell us is Damshak, Damascus. The Lebanon, if it was a country, it would have to be below that. And where is Hamath? Because Hamath is described as a far greater land area. It's a land area. It's not just uh, some little city. So again and again, when you start looking at the detail, and you start paying attention to what the text actually says, the Middle Eastern location, the Palestinian location of Bible events, does not work. So, I will see you again soon. Um, I've been sick with this chest thing for a while, which has kept me from um, doing readings and whatnot. So, uh, hopefully I'll be over that uh, sometime here uh, very soon and uh, get back to some of those other things. So, uh, um, everybody, take care. See you next time.